Uh, okay, I got a notification saying the recording is in progress. So we're live, people. Um, with that, I want to dive into a topic that's very near and dear to my heart, snakes in general and snakes of the Eno River watershed. Um, I grew up just being obsessed with snakes and herpetology and going out in the woods and catching critters like these. So um, I've been working with them for a long time and I love them dearly. And uh, I hope that this lunch and learn um, gives you a deeper understanding and appreciation for some of the diversity we have here along the Eno and also uh, how cool and important snakes are. Um, but being that we have, whoop, I still have to click to change slides. Being that we have a little while together, I wanted to just let y'all know what sort of ground we'll be covering, what I'm going to be subjecting you to. So I wanted to start with just an introduction to the Eno River and the Eno River Association and my role within the Eno River Association, and then sort of do a broad overview of snake biology and their importance and diversity of snakes in North Carolina and the Eno watershed. And I thought we'd spend most of the talk talking specifically about snakes of the Eno, uh, going through different species that you might see in different habitats. Um, and then I wanted to wrap up by talking not only about snake conservation, but also busting some, some myths and misconceptions that we hear a lot um, about snakes. Um, so I just wanted to start with an overview of the Eno River and the Eno River Association. Uh, so the Eno River uh, starts a little bit northwest of Hillsboro at the Confluence Natural Area, which is owned and operated by the Eno River Association. And it flows for about 40 miles uh, before winding up in Falls Lake, uh, which in turn drains into the Noose River, which flows into the Atlantic. Um, so the watershed of the Eno River Association, I hope you all can see my mouse, probably, um, but it's it's outlined in red here. So it's most of uh, it's a, it's a large chunk of Durham and Orange counties, uh, including the north half of Durham, uh, all of Hillsboro. Uh, so it's a pretty sizable watershed, and and it's responsible for providing providing drinking water to Hillsboro, and then Falls Lake provides drinking water to parts of Wake County. So it's it's a really important um, both ecologically and uh, to people. And uh, the Eno River Association was formed in 1966 in response to the threat of dams being formed uh, along the Eno. Uh, and the organization was successful in preventing those dams from being formed. Um, and uh, yeah, I see that Audrey's posting links to the website in the chat. Uh, that's that's awesome. Check that out. Um, yeah, the, the, the organization was successful in preventing the dams from being formed. Uh, and has now grown to 12 full-time staff plus seasonal uh, staff. So we've, we've gotten quite a lot bigger um, and we're involved in a whole lot of stuff. So we, we buy and conserve land uh, in the Eno watershed, protect it and manage it in perpetuity. Um, some of that land gets transferred to Eno River State Park. Uh, some of that land like our Confluence Natural Area and our Panther Branch Natural Area, we own and operate ourselves. Um, we also do a lot of education and advocacy work. Um, we put on the annual festival for the Eno that happens every July. So we're involved in a, in a lot of ways in the, in the Durham and broader triangle community. Um, as the AmeriCorps education program coordinator, my role is, is mostly on the education and outreach side. So I, I work with a lot of schools, um, we do guided hikes and, and public programs and private programs. Um, there's lots of cool educational opportunities that we that we offer. Um, and I'm sure Audrey will, will pop links uh, to those uh, in the chat. Um, I also thought that I would read uh, the mission statement. Uh, Eno River Association's mission is to protect the natural, cultural, and historic resources of the Eno River Basin in Durham and Orange counties. Uh, and this is also a, a chance for me to give you some non-snake pictures on this first slide here, because the, the rest of the uh, presentation is going to be filled with a lot of snake pictures. Um, but we do a lot more than uh, than just work with snakes. Um, cool. So with all that uh, out of the way, I wanted to give 
people a little introduction to some snake biology. Um, we do a lot of education and outreach, and we realize that that people snakes are apparently a confusing group of organisms. People don't always know what they are. People have a lot of misconceptions about them. Um, so I just wanted to start really generally, and uh, really basically, and 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 introduce a few terms. So snakes are members of the suborder Serpentes, just the snakes, within class Reptilia. So if you were not good in, uh, in, in remembering these, uh, the, there's, I think, acronyms to remember this, but I've included the, the classification scheme on the upper right there. Um, so other classes would include amphibians, um, birds, mammals. That's the class level within the class of reptiles. There's several different orders. So crocodilians, your alligators and crocodiles, that's one order. Turtles are another. Snakes and lizards are lumped into one order together. So if we just isolate snakes, that's a suborder. And uh, as a sidebar, snakes and all reptiles are more closely related to birds than they are to anything else. People tend to lump them in with amphibians, I guess, because they're both kind of creepy crawly type things, but they're very closely related to birds. Um, so closely related, in fact, that crocodilians, so alligators and crocodiles are more closely related to birds than they are to other reptiles. So they're really, really closely related. And all reptiles are, are what's called ectotherms. That's just the technical term uh, for what people call cold-blooded. Um, scientists don't like the term cold-blooded because it's a little bit of a misnomer. Um, snake's blood can be uh, just as warm as as people's blood is. It, it just means that uh, they can't regulate their own body temperature internally like mammals and birds can. They, they have to rely on the external environmental temperature. Um, so that's a, that's a good word to know. Um, snakes are distinguished by having no limbs. Uh, they don't have movable eyelids or external ears. They have skin covered with scales. Um, they're also amniotes, like birds and mammals, which means that they have amniotic eggs. So the embryo develops within uh, several different membranes um, within an egg. Um, not, uh, not all snakes lay eggs. In some snakes, um, the eggs hatch internally and uh, they give birth to live young. Um, but all snakes are amniotes nonetheless. And globally, uh, we have a pretty huge diversity of snakes. Uh, so there's about 2,900 species worldwide, around 600 of which are venomous. Um, the vast majority of these are uh, concentrated around the tropics. So Sub-Saharan Africa, uh, Central and South America, South and Southeast Asia. Um, we don't have nearly that number of species in North America. Um, but the diversity of snakes is pretty incredible, both in what they look like and what sort of ecological role they're playing in their environment. Um, so if we have everything ranging, not in, not in uh, North America, but uh, globally, uh, snakes range from uh, the Barbados thread snake, which I've pictured here on the lower left. Uh, they reach an adult size of uh, four inches and subsist on ants and termites and invertebrates that are really, really small. And then the longest uh, snake in the world over here on the bottom right is the reticulated python. And uh, the heaviest snake is actually the green anaconda, which, which can weigh upwards of 500 pounds. Um, so they can get huge. And obviously they're playing a really different uh, role in the environment than a Barbados thread snake. So they're able to eat really large mammals and even crocodilians. Um, so it's, it's really a, a huge, uh, hugely diverse group. And then these middle two snakes here on the bottom are both uh, native to North Carolina, but uh, not the Eno watershed. I just included them because I, I think they're cool looking. Uh, this is a scarlet king snake over here on the left, and this is a timber rattlesnake uh, on the right. Um, and then I wanted to include this map uh, to give folks an idea of how successful snakes have been as a group of organisms. So they've been able to colonize uh, all of the continents with the exception of Antarctica um, and the, the really uh, cold and glaciated areas. Um, they've also been able to colonize much of the, the oceans. So there's a group of snakes called sea snakes 
um, that live in these uh, warmer oceans out here. And they spend their entire uh, life cycle in the open ocean and they, they never come on land. Um, so they're really cool. Um, you should feel free to check them out. Uh, I'm not going to spend much time talking about them here, but I just wanted to mention that they are a thing. Um, I also wanted to talk about snakes uh, being really ecologically important because people don't often realize the role they're playing uh, in the global environment and in the North Carolina and Eno environment. Um, one of the things we like to tell people when we go into schools is that is that snakes are really critical members of food webs. Um, I've attached a really sim simplified diagram here on the on the bottom left. Um, in reality, it would be a whole lot more complex than this because snakes eat um, dozens and dozens of different things. Obviously, with the range of size of snakes, it's a, it's a huge range of what they're eating. And then also lots and lots of things will eat snakes. So they're really important predators. Um, in some environments, they're even apex predators. And then they're also really important prey um, for a lot of animals. Uh, and they're also really good at regulating pest species. So mice and rats and lots of pest invertebrates. Uh, they're really important in controlling those populations. Um, they're also, we like to use them at the Eno River Association as an indicator species for ecosystem health. Um, so snakes are because in part because of their, uh, their ectothermic, uh, right. Cold blooded. Um, they are sensitive to changes in climate. Uh, they're also sensitive to changes in water quality and habitat quality. Uh, so we, among other things, look at reptile diversity and snake diversity as a metric for how we assess the health of our ecosystems. If we go into a habitat and there's 10 different kinds of snakes there, um, it's probably doing pretty well uh, ecologically. But if there's if there's none or one species, there's probably something pretty off. So it's a, it's a good metric for looking at ecosystem health. And then also uh, the, the animals they eat, their prey, uh, like amphibians, are often really sensitive themselves to ecosystem health. So they're part of a of a of a web of organisms that's that's really good at indicating ecosystem health. And then finally, um, snakes are really good regulators of disease and uh, uh, prevention of the spread of disease. A lot of the animals that they eat, uh, namely rats and mice, uh, can be disease vectors. So by keeping those populations down, uh, they're preventing the spread of disease. Um, but more interestingly. Uh, at least to me, um, they are eating a huge number of ticks because of the mammals that they're consuming. I read a study um, from 2013 that was done at the University of Maryland that, that estimated that a single adult timber rattlesnake, which is a species that we have in North Carolina, a single adult timber rattlesnake eats between 2,500 and 4,500 ticks in a single year, which I just thought was crazy. Um, so really, really important uh, uh, regulators of the spread of disease uh, and important um, controls on pest populations. Uh, a world without snakes would probably look a lot like this, but I know people are on their lunch break, so I will fast forward through that. Um, I also want to talk a little bit briefly about what snake diversity looks like uh, here in North Carolina. Um, so we have 37 species statewide. Uh, a lot of them are concentrated around the coast and in the southeastern portion of the state. Uh, we have six venomous species statewide and seven species of conservation concern. Um, four of the species of conservation concern are actually venomous species. So a lot of our venomous species are pretty rare. Most of the venomous species are concentrated, again, near the coast. Um, we have one venomous species locally, um, a couple that are found in the Piedmont, a couple that are found in the mountains, but the majority are found near the coast. Uh, two of our venomous species, the Eastern Diamondback Rattlesnake, which I've shown here, and the Coral Snake are exceedingly rare in, in North Carolina and are known uh, from kind of small areas each along the coast, essentially one population each, very small areas. Um, in the Eno watershed here in Durham and Orange counties around the Triangle, uh, we have about 17 species of snake, give or take one or two. Um, and only one of those species is venomous. 
Um, I'll talk a lot more about that a little later. People, people often think that there's more than one venomous species around here. There's just one. Um, and with that being said, uh, I thought what we would do next, being that we can't actually be out in the field today looking for snakes as much as I would like to, um, I thought we would do like a little virtual hike through the Eno, um, some of the habitats you might come across and some of the snakes that you might see in each of those habitats and talk a little bit about them. Um, my hope was to find uh, one trail that goes through all of these different types of habitats and get pictures from all along that trail um, and take an actual hike uh, virtually, but I wasn't able to do that with the time that I had. So these are gonna be a little bit, they'll pick and choose pictures from different parts of the Eno, but they're all from the Eno. Um, so if you spend any amount of time in Eno River State Park or doing any sort of hiking in Durham and Orange Counties, you're likely to spend a lot of your time in uh, upland forest, right, woodlands. So examples would be parts of the Buck Quarter Creek uh, Trail and Eno River State Park, Cox Mountain Trail and uh, Eno River State Park. And this is just a little smattering of a few of the snake species that you're most likely to see in those habitats. So the first of those is the one that people are often most concerned about is the Eastern Copperhead. And this is our only venomous species. And I'm gonna talk about these guys a little bit more in depth a little later on in the talk because people tend to have a lot of questions about them. But for now, uh, suffice it to say that they are the only medically significant species around here. Uh, we also have common garter snakes. Uh, these guys are pretty distinctive looking. They have uh, their sort of dark background color and they have a, a yellow uh, or light colored stripe run all the way down the back. Um, there are, I believe, the, the most common and widespread snake species in North America. So there's many, many species of garter snakes throughout North America. We only have one, it's just the common garter snake. Um, but they're really, really widespread and, and successful throughout uh, North and Central America. Um, some people will call these garden snakes, like being in your garden, I guess. Um, they're not garden snakes, they're garter snakes. Uh, I believe they're named for uh, striped garter straps that uh, ladies back in the day would use to hold their stockings up. Uh, you can feel free to Google that if you'd like. I won't belabor that here, but they're not garden snakes. Um, another snake that we have that people see all the time in Eno River State Park uh, are eastern rat snakes or black rat snakes. Um, they're one of two species of black snakes. People call people call them black snakes. We've got two species of black snakes around here. People kind of use the term interchangeably, but we're going to talk about both species today. Um, these snakes are uh, our largest snake, so it's not uncommon to see black rat snakes that are five or six feet long. And uh, I believe the record... Uh, I don't know where it was found. I don't think in North Carolina, but I believe that the record black rat snake was over eight feet long. So they can be really large and they're constrictors, uh, totally harmless to humans again, but they are really successful predators of small mammals mainly and, and birds, sometimes bird nests, sometimes they'll eat eggs. Um, and they're highly arboreal, which means that they spend a lot of time up in trees and lots of these are seen every year in uh, throughout the Eno River watershed. Uh, and then I also wanted to include uh, this picture of a ringneck snake here. These are, you're a lot less likely to see these because they're really small. Uh, they're only, you know, a foot or two long at most. Um, they tend to spend most of their time underground. They eat mostly invertebrates. Um, I don't have a ton to say about them. I just, I honestly needed a fourth picture to fill this little spot here. So I thought I would put ringneck snakes in there because it is possible that you would see one going out. I've seen them around here around the Eno River uh, office on Guest Road on the trail. Um, so continuing our walk, uh, you're obviously going to spend a lot of time along rivers and riparian areas, meaning just the habitat directly around a river. If you spend much time in uh, Eno River State Park or in any of the, the areas we manage around here. Uh, and there's a few species uh, that you're that you're especially likely to see in these areas. The first of these is a common water snake or a northern water snake. 
Um, according to iNaturalist, that's the most commonly observed species of snake in Eno River State Park. So people see these all the time, especially uh, directly in and around the river. Um, and they can get pretty large. They can get up to about four feet long and they're kind of chunky. So they tend to freak people out. Um, people also mistake them for uh, copperheads or water moccasins, uh, but they're totally harmless to people. Uh, they just kind of want to do their thing and eat fish and amphibians. Um, another species that we have right around Eno River pretty commonly is uh, called a queen snake. Um, so you often see these guys basking in shrubs and vegetation overhanging the river so that if they're threatened, they can just drop right into the river and swim away. And these are a little smaller than water snakes. Uh, they're typically around two feet long-ish as an adult. Um, and they, they feed on primarily uh, freshly molted crayfish. They're really, they're specialists um, and they're able to detect the chemical cues of a freshly molted crayfish, I guess, because they're easier to digest and they prefer to eat those. Although they will sometimes eat like fish and amphibians. Uh, and then if you're really lucky, you might see an Eastern king snake in one of these areas. Uh, they are seen sometimes in Eno River State Park, but they're pretty uncommon. And they're really distinctive looking. They have these beautiful black and white or black and yellow sort of chain patterns running down the back. Uh, and they're called king snakes because they eat other snakes. Um, they're immune to snake venom, so they can eat copperheads. People often, people that don't want snakes around their house often don't mind king snakes because they feel like they'll protect them from the other snakes, I guess. I don't know if that's true, um, but they do definitely eat other snakes and sometimes venomous snakes. Um, but they're pretty uncommon around the Eno. Another habitat that's uh, that's sort of less common, but we do have, especially up at our confluence natural area, that's where this photo is from, is uh, grasslands. Uh, a lot of the grasslands around here are farmland or hay fields or agricultural in some way. There are a couple of habitats that are managed as uh, prairie habitats, so prairie grassland, uh, like at Penny's Bend, I believe. Um, and there are a few snake species that you're likely to see in these grasslands. Um, although I will say that, that most of these, the, the, the species that I've included here, it's probably more accurate to say that they're grassland edge species. They really like the, the edge between, uh, an open, an open habitat and uh, a wooded area because it gives them a, a really nice mix of sunlight and basking habitat and then uh, shelter, uh, sheltered area in the forest. Uh, the first of these is a really distinctive looking snake called a rough green snake. And these are pretty common around here, but they're really difficult to spot because they spend most of their time up in bushes and trees. And they look exactly like a vine or a twig. Um, they're really long and skinny. And uh, they uh, will have their head moving just kind of uh, the same speed as the other leaves on the tree, just to mimic a leaf blowing in the breeze. Uh, and it's really, really difficult to spot them. They're really good at avoiding uh, detection. And they're, they eat, they're insectivorous, so they, they eat mostly insects. Um, but they're a really cool species that people see frequently. And uh, a lot of people don't realize that we have such a, a tropical looking snake around here in our backyards, but we do. And they're, and they're really cool. Um, and then our second black snake that we have around here is a, is a species of open areas. Uh, it's called the black racer. These, these two snakes are both the same species up top here. The one on the left is a juvenile and they look like this. They have this really cool pattern for the first year or two. And then as they get older, they start to turn this sort of solid charcoal black, uh, color. Um, they're called racers because they move really, really fast. Uh, I think they're our fastest snake. I think they can they can move up to eight to 10 miles an hour, uh, which might not sound like that fast, but it's, I promise you, quite fast. I think the fastest snake in the world is the black mama, mamba, and they can go about 12 miles an hour. So it's, it's pretty quick. Um, there are ways to differentiate these um, from black rat snakes. They're pretty difficult to tell apart to the untrained eye. Um, I don't necessarily want to get into that, the differences here, because I want the takeaway to be that there's two species of black snakes around here. They're not the same thing. They're both 
harmless to humans and really helpful to the environment. But if people want to hear more about them at the end, I'm happy to talk about that. Um, I also wanted to include a habitat uh, where you're also likely to see snakes because not a lot of people live in, you know, River State Park proper. Uh, and there's a handful of snake species that you're uh, likely to see even in downtown Durham. Uh, if you're working in your garden or you live in a an area with any sort of green space. Um, I won't spend too much time here because these are all really small species. They spend, they're about the size of the palm of your hand or your hand. Um, they spend most of their time uh, underground or under debris. They eat mostly invertebrates and they're pretty tough to uh, differentiate uh, if you don't know what you're looking for. Um, but I'll just go through them real quick. The one on the top left is the decays brown snake um, going clockwise. That's a smooth earth snake on the top right. Uh, the red belly snake on the bottom left and eastern worm snake. Uh, I think named because they look a lot like worms if you see them in your garden. Um, but all of these, uh, it's it, they are pretty common and do really well in disturbed areas um, of Durham and Orange Counties. Um, moving on, I wanted to spend some time talking about copperheads because that seems to be the snake that strikes the most fear into people's, uh, hearts and they are medically significant. They are venomous. Um, but I think a lot of their bad reputation is undeserved. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in a second, but first I want to talk about, uh, how you identify copperheads because people, uh, seem to think that they know. But then going into schools and talking to people, it becomes, it, you know, it's clear that not everybody does know how to do it. So um, the first thing that I look for is this sort of coppery background color, like a penny. No other snake in the Eno watershed has that same color. Um, they also have these really distinctive Hershey's kiss shaped uh, blotches on the sides. Again, no other snake in the Eno watershed has that. Um, they're actually really distinctive looking snakes. Typically, if you see a copperhead, you know that it's a copperhead. Um, there's a couple other characteristics that people use. Um, people look at the vertical pupils and they look at the triangular head. I think those are both bad uh, ways to identify copperheads because, first of all, lots of snakes will flatten out their heads and make it look triangular when they're threatened. It's a great defense mechanism uh, because if they make you think that they're venomous, you're not gonna mess with them. And that's why they're successful at doing that. And then also the vertical pupils doesn't really work because they're only vertical if it's really light out. If it's dark out, uh, they're like cat's pupils, right? They dilate and they look round when it's, when it's dark out. So that's not a, a perfect system uh, to identify them. Uh, I also think that if you're close enough to see if a copperhead's pupil is vertical, you're probably too close. Um, so despite them, looking distinctive like this there are a few species around here that people get tripped up on and kind of confused for for copperheads more than other species and i wanted to talk about those here for a second so the first of those is an eastern hognose snake um to me they don't look anything like copperheads but i can see why people would make that mistake um they they're uh, really good at they flatten out their heads and necks like this when they're threatened and they can hiss and they look really intimidating um, they do like elaborate bluffing and defensive displays, but they're totally harmless to people. Um, they're actually also very rare in the Eno watershed. I've never seen one around here. They are here, but uh, I'm hoping to see one. So I haven't yet, and I've been looking. So another one is uh, the mole king snake. This is another pretty uncommon species around here. Um, I guess it has sort of a similar background color to a copperhead. It's not really coppery to my eye, at least, but they don't have anything that resembles the Hershey's Kiss um, patterning. They just have these sort of reddish blotches on the back. And also you can't really tell from this picture super well, but the head is just a totally different shape. They have these really oval heads. Um, it's light colored, not at all like the copperhead. And then the one that people get tripped up on the most uh, as I mentioned before, is the, the common water snake. Um, and I can see why these look a little bit similar to copperheads. This one is, you can, this one's flattening out its head in sort of a defensive display. Um, they get a little bit chunkier, sort of like a copperhead type uh, proportions, 
but they're a much darker color overall. And then they have these square blotches on the back instead of uh, uh, Hershey's Kiss shape. They I've never seen a Northern Water Snake with with copperhead patterning like that. Um, I will also say that uh, copperhead bites are very, very rarely fatal to healthy adults. Um, the venom is just much less toxic than other North American venomous snakes like rattlesnakes and coral snakes. And they're generally not super large compared to like a big rattlesnake. So they don't have as much venom. Um, and that being said, it will definitely ruin your day to get bitten by a copperhead. So don't go out and mess with them. But I think people are are really afraid of them. And I think that reputation is only is, is not really deserved because they're really non-aggressive. They just they just want to get away from people. Um, and actually with venomous snakes in general in the United States, you are actually more likely to die by being struck by lightning, uh, attacked by dogs, or stung by bees in the United States in the United States than you are by being bitten by a venomous snake of any species. Um, there's about seven to eight thousand snake envenomations every year in the United States, and about five of those prove fatal. Um, I I have some links to some some data on that, which which Audrey can feel free to post in the chat um, if you should feel interested in in some further reading. Um, so moving along, uh, I wanted to talk about some really common myths and misconceptions that we hear all the time doing school programs. Um, it seems like people are a little bit misinformed about a few things and uh, I wanna try to set the record straight here. So the first of these is that snakes can unhinge their jaws. This is just not true. Uh, if you feel on your chin, uh, you have two bumps. Um, so I, I think everybody should be able to feel it. Um, that's where your lower, the two halves of your lower jaws, uh, of your lower jaw fuses. Um, snakes don't have that their lower jaw is is not fused with itself um so they could that allows them to swallow much larger prey they can also move uh the different parts of their jaw independently so they can move the top right part of their jaw and the bottom left part of their jaw at the same time and pull pull prey items into their mouth but they can't unhinge their jaws from the rest of their skull which would mean like disconnecting uh, this lower jawbone from the rest of the skull. So that's a myth. Another thing that we hear all the time is that snakes chase people who get too close to them. This is also just not true. Um, I'm sure lots of people believe that they have been chased by a snake um, or else that they wouldn't they, they wouldn't say that probably. but this is just uh, this is just false. Snakes want to get away from people. Sometimes I guess if a snake is really, really stressed and it gets really confused, it might try to get away from you and accidentally sort of come closer to you. Their depth perception is not that good. Um, or they might have a rock or hole that they're trying to get to and you happen to be standing in between them uh, and the hole. Uh, but I have been chasing snakes for many, many years and I have never been chased back. So I can assure you that this is a myth. Um, another thing we hear all the time is that baby venomous snakes are more dangerous than adults because they can't control the amount of venom that they inject. This is also false. Um, baby venomous snakes are just as able to control the amount of venom that they inject as adults. Um, a sizable percentage of all venomous snake bites are dry bites, meaning that no venom is, is injected. Um, and baby venomous snakes are just a lot smaller uh, than adults. They have much less venom. So if, if you're gonna get bitten by a venomous snake, which I don't recommend, I think it's smarter to go with a baby venomous snake than an adult. And finally, we hear a lot of people calling snakes poisonous. Uh, this is, in North America at least, not true. Poison is something that's ingested. So puffer fish and toads and newts are poisonous. Uh, venom is injected. So anything that can sting or bite you to inject the venom is venomous. Snakes in North America are venomous. They're not poisonous. There is a snake species in Southeast Asia uh, that is um, truly poisonous. It's able to sequester poison from its prey and it has glands where it can store that. Um, so it's not totally a myth, but it's mostly a myth. Um, moving on, I wanted to finish with uh, a little bit of a talk about some of the conservation work that we do 
uh, here at the Eno River Association and ways that you can be involved uh, in your own lives, should that interest you. Um, so the main threats right now to snake populations are human interaction, both directly and indirectly. Um, so directly meaning lots of, uh, lots of people indiscriminately kill snakes on site. Um, I don't think that's ever the right call personally, um, but lots of people do it anyway. Um, people run snakes over on the road, lots of uh, snakes and people just don't tend to mix super well. And that's been, uh, a losing battle for the, for the snakes. Um, habitat loss is a way that human interaction indirectly contributes to, to snake population decline. So just the development, growth of cities and urban sprawl, removal of open space, clearing of land is really detrimental to snake populations. And then, as I mentioned earlier, uh, climate change is affecting uh, a lot of our snake populations because they are ectotherms. They're, they're not able to regulate their own body temperature, so they're really sensitive to changes in climate. Um, so a few things that we do at the Eno River Association to combat this are uh, doing the direct land conservation that I talked about. So buying up, uh, acquiring land and protecting it and managing it in perpetuity to keep it as uh, open space. Uh, and that's successful in just providing the habitat for snakes to, to thrive. And then what I'm more involved with as an education person is the advocacy side and educational programs. So we do a lot of programs, uh, especially targeted at young people. And we do them across a range of topics, but a lot of them have some sort of component uh, of reptile diversity and snake diversity. And in some cases, we're able to take live animals into schools and let kids interact with them. And I think that's a really important um, first step in, in getting people and young people to maybe uh foster a little bit more of an empathetic connection with these animals and also confront maybe some of the the misunderstandings or the the misinformation they grew up with about snakes um so that's that's really a lot of fun and it's been really successful i think in, in uh helping the younger generation and and the general public get get more interested in snakes and snake conservation uh, another thing we do at the eno we've got a few prescribed burns uh, on the on the docket for some of our properties, uh, land management like that to maintain open habitats is really important for snakes because they rely on a matrix of forested and open land. It's really important for not only snakes, but a lot of different species. Um, so that's another thing that we do that allows us to keep land open and also remove invasive species. Um, so should you be interested in uh, furthering the cause of snake uh, conservation like me. Uh, I wanted to include a little slide that, uh, that talked about what, what y'all can do as members of the general public. Uh, I think the best thing to do when it comes to snakes is learn as much as you can about them and then let them be. Just let them, uh, leave them alone. They wanna be left alone. Uh, they don't wanna be messed with. Uh, people and snakes, as I said, uh, don't mix well and uh, and that's when people run into trouble, I think. Uh, the majority, and this is not true uh, universally, but the majority of uh, snake bites that are envenomations in the United States occur uh, to young men between 17 and 27. They occur on the hands and fingers. And in a significant uh, proportion of those, uh, alcohol was involved. And the, the person was either trying to kill or handle a snake, which I just, I think that's just a bad idea. Um, so best thing you can do uh, to keep yourself and the snakes in our environment safe is just to leave them alone. I'm not going to say that those people that, that were the young men in question deserve to be bitten, but I don't think you can really blame the, the snakes in that situation um, for defending themselves. Um, so moving along another one of the the biggest threats i think i mentioned earlier uh, to, to snake populations is road mortality so snakes love coming out on the roads because uh, the black top is great at absorbing heat and it's a nice open space for them to warm up and to bask but that's obviously not a wise move for them because lots of people don't see snakes and hit them on accident and then lots of people will also see see snakes on the road and hit them on purpose so that's a huge burden on their population health. Um, so one of the best things that you could do is just to be mindful when you're driving through uh, 
any sort of snake habitat, which is honestly most of Durham and Orange counties uh, anytime during the warmer months. Um, and then uh, if I haven't managed to convince you that you should have lots of snakes around your house and you don't want them around your house, I respect that. That's fine. If you don't want them around your house, the best thing that you can do is just to not make habitat for them. So don't uh, don't let your grass grow long. Keep it cut short. Don't have lots of rocks lying around that they can hide under. Um, don't have lots of debris. If you have lots of bird seed, lot bird seed lying around in your lawn, it will attract mice and birds, which will attract snakes because they eat the mice and birds. Um, on the other hand, if you're like me and you do want a bunch of snakes around your house, do exactly the opposite. Let it grow free and wild and throw a bunch of rocks around and stuff and throw a bunch of bird seed out there and they will come. Um, with that, uh, I wanted to end with this quote from Baba Diem, who is a Senegalese conservationist. And he said, in the end, we will conserve only what we love. We will love only what we understand and we will understand only what we are taught. And I think that applies really well to snakes because they're simultaneously some of the most uh, maligned and misunderstood animals, I think, and they were on the world, uh, but they're also some of the most fascinating and beautiful and important. And I hope uh, that this talk has given y'all a little bit of a better understanding of uh, that importance and also the diversity that we have around here uh, on the Eno River and in uh, Durham and Orange counties. Um, and with that, I would like to open it up for questions. Thanks for coming out, y'all. Awesome. Eli, we had a couple of questions and comments in the chat. I think we pretty much covered most of them. Um, oh. Maggie asked if you had a citation for the article about the number of ticks a rattlesnake might eat. Um, I realized after the fact that you had linked, you had put a link in your notes. So I included that as the like synopsis for um, that article and then also included the citation. Cool. Um, I will say that that article was from an oral presentation uh, that was given at a conference. Um, I, I, I don't know that it's been replicated since. Uh, it's a pretty serious number that they were estimating. Um, so it will be interesting to see if there were any follow-ups done. I couldn't find any, but it's uh, it's a sizable number of ticks that they eat regardless. Yeah. Yeah. I didn't know that. So that's really cool. Um, and then... Uh, Maggie also asked if you took the pictures in this slide show. And I said, I don't think all of them, but maybe some of them, but I'm not sure. <laughs> Most of them I didn't. Most of them are unsighted and stolen from the internet. Uh, <laughs> but there are a couple that I did take uh, towards the end. Um, awesome. I wish I took them all. Yeah. I feel like you're the type that is just so, when you encounter snakes, you're so excited about it. You, you don't even think to take a picture. <laughs> Yeah, I'm not I'm not much of a photographer. I've got friends that are really big into that and I wish I, I had the patience for it, but I just yeah. it's never been my thing. But I, these are all beautiful shots. So I'm grateful uh that these people have uh unknowingly sacrificed their their pictures for, yes. for me. Great, great pics. Um and then Randy asked about it about the baby copperhead thing, about whether it was true that baby copperheads will pump more venom than adults. I think you covered that, but Randy, if you have further questions on that, definitely feel free, I think, to ask. Or Eli, if you want to expand at all. Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to talk about that more. Um, maybe baby copperheads and baby venomous snakes are, are just as, as capable of regulating the amount of venom they can, they can inject. Um, they're able to do that as soon as they're born. Um, and that ability doesn't change throughout their lives. The only thing that changes is their size. And as they get larger, they just have more venom that they can inject. But I think about the same proportion of uh, babies and adults um, uh, give dry bites and give the same amount of venom proportionately in their bites. And this is uh, borne out by a lot of studies that that are, I didn't link any in my in my notes here, but but you should be able to find this with some, some Googling. Mm -hmm. I hope that yeah. helps. I spent a lot of time on the internet reading about that because I, that is something I hear so often. I feel like that's like one of the most common misconceptions about snakes is like, be really on the lookout for the babies because, you know, they're way more dangerous. And it's like, no, no, that's not, not necessarily true. 
Um, uh, and then let's see, sorry. So Maggie actually said, so Maggie said that if you follow national snake bite support and Maggie sent a link to that, it says Dr. Spencer Green says that the majority of snake bites are due to inadvertent contact, usually to unshod feet. Ah. So there, there are conflicting uh, reports on this, and it depends on what part of the United States that you're looking at. I was referencing a couple of links, one of which was the CDC's uh, snake bite info, and another one was the annual report of the National Poida, Poison uh, Data System. Um, but different studies find slightly different things, uh, be that as it may, a, a really sizable percentage of, uh, of snake bites are happening to, to the young men that are messing with snakes and they shouldn't be and it's happening to hands and fingers um but yes definitely one of the best ways that you can avoid getting bitten by snakes is to wear closed-toed shoes yeah and i found a study from like 1988 that kind of is a i mean that says is talking about young men who are intoxicated intoxicated and have purposely handled a venomous snake so i think um number one randy says number one drunk young men without shoes <laughs> Probably a big risk factor there. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. Not and I think there's another, there's another question about uh, cotton mouths. We do not have cotton mouths here. That is true. Uh, there are a couple pockets uh, in rural Wake County, if you go a little bit east of Raleigh, but the vast majority of cotton mouth populations are closer to the coast. We don't have any uh, west and north of Raleigh. We don't have any in Durham and Orange counties. People call those water moccasins. So sometimes people will say that they've seen a water moccasin. Uh, if they said that in Eno River State Park, they have not seen a water snake, uh, water moccasin. They probably saw a water snake. Yeah, I'm sure that's a lot of the confusion is just seeing a snake in the water. I think that's where a lot of a lot of people's minds go because they've heard water moccasin. And anybody else have any questions? They want to come on on camera or on audio or or anything, feel free. That was really great, Eli. Nice job. Thank you, Hillary. Yeah, Thank if nobody welcome. else has any questions, we can uh, wrap it up. I don't know if there's any uh, announcements or things that, that y'all have, the other education folks, or uh, no, questions. Yeah, I was just going to link our events calendar in the um, in the chat. Oops, I exited out of the chat. So if anyone's interested in some of the um, programs, you know, like Eli said, we do some public programs. And of course, our guided hike series in the spring, you could maybe see a snake. So you never know. Um, yeah, I was going to say the, uh, the guided hike series, the March uh, registration links will be included in the February e-news. So if you're a part of our e-news email list, um, just know that the registration links for our final winter guided hike, which will be guided by Audrey uh, at Riverwalk in Hillsborough, will be happening. Uh, and then also we'll get started with our wildflower hike series. So maybe as the weather warms up, we'll have lots of flowers to see, but also snakes. And I think Pete's leading one of the March hikes that'll be open for registration. And Pete has a question about rattlesnakes. Yeah. yeah, so um, when I used to work for the Corps of Engineers and we were building recreation areas around Falls Lake, um, I didn't see it, but I saw where someone had unfortunately found and killed a rattlesnake. And I was wondering if there was, you know, if there have been any sightings. You said we, there, we haven't seen any, but um, and would there be suitable habitat to find rattlesnakes somewhere on the Eno? That's a good question. Um, I did leave out a little bit of information, which is that there is an isolated pocket of rattlesnakes in Granville County. So a little bit north of Falls Lake. Um, my guess is that snake that you saw was probably a straggler from that population. It's mostly on private land and a military base up there on the Butner area. Um, but they're, they're really rare up there. Um, my guess is that the rattlesnakes would need more uh, unbroken forested habitat than is in the, you know, I mean, historically, uh, there were, there were definitely timber rattlesnakes throughout, uh, Durham and Orange counties. 
Uh, my guess is that right now, the, the main differences between the Eno and that area where they still occur up in Granville County is that that latter area has a lot more forested area. There's like some wooded wetlands. I think they like to hibernate down here in, in wooded wetlands um, like that where they can get below the frost line. Um, there is definitely, there historically was habitat in Eno River State Park, um, but they're not, they're, they've been extirpated there in part because of how dense the human population is. Does that answer your question? Yeah, that, that makes sense. I'm thinking about like the DuBose tract and some of the bigger places that are, you know, in the Inner River State Park master plan, but are not yet acquired, mm. like north of 70, between 70 and the and the river. Okay. That, you know, might be, you know, enough and undeveloped enough. Um, but yeah, I, I suppose it's possible that uh, that there would still be a couple hanging on in there. I just think it's I think it's unlikely because they're a, a large and distinctive enough snake that if they're there, typically someone will run into one eventually. So people do see them every once in a while. Like the local residents know that there are rattlesnakes up in Granville County. You don't see them very often, but if you ask people, they'll tell you it's like, oh yeah, you know, the so-and-so saw one. And you just don't hear about that kind of thing happening closer into Durham. Um, but it is it is possible, I suppose. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. So we had a question um, from Hamid uh, about when the um, the link will be available. So we will put the uh, we will add this video to our YouTube channel, which is I Heart the Eno. I'll write it. Well, I wrote it within the chat if you want to look at it. Um, so if anyone is interested in sharing it with a friend or you know review reviewing it later, then it will be on our YouTube channel probably sometime next week. Great job, Eli. I learned a lot, so that's great. And if no one else has questions, we'll see y'all next time. And thank you so much for joining us. Thanks, y'all. Thanks, Eli. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Hi, <Natalie>. Kathy. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Eli. Thank you. <laughs> Love you. <laughs> Thank you. Enjoyed it. Thank you. Oh, good turnout today. Lots of people showed up. That was great, Eli. I really, I mean, you know, I like to think that I know quite a bit about snakes, but I still learned stuff. So, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. I did too, and, and I didn't know about the tick, the, the amount of ticks that they were eating. Yeah. I have a pretty crazy estimate, so I was trying to do some fact-checking on that. Um, I thought I would still include that, that statistic, but...